<laughs> there he is. Dean Del Rey, the man, the myth, the legend. How you doing? How's it hanging, my friend? My God, how long has it been since I've seen you? Look how fucked up we look. Man, what happened? Well, 40, what, almost 45 years? 45 years? I think we're creeping up on it, right? 85 yeah. is when I quit the band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, um, let's see. So uh, when did it start? 80? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's when I first, so 80 to now, I'm 58. How old are you? 63. Wow. It's just a, as of last week. So, yeah. <laughs> Introduce yourself, my man. Uh, James Hume, lead singer, former lead singer of Roadrunner. <laughs> I can't fucking believe it. Now, first of all, two things. How did you hear the Vicious Rumors episode? How did you know about it? Because Aries also commented on it. So what happened there? So Aries actually sent it to me. And he goes, if you haven't already heard this, you need to. And and I and I saw it was you. And I was like, what? What the hell? <laughs> and it was such a it was such a nice treat, you know, to see that you're doing this and you're, you're doing very well, I understand. So that that's awesome, man. Now, I want to give you uh, a, a little rundown because I, I let's take it kind of backwards. You said you quit in what year? 85? 85. Our last show was at the Stone, uh, February 8th. Actually, there's a there's a plaque on the wall here. February 8th, uh, 85. And we were just picked by Bam Magazine for 5 and 85. We were one of the five bands or artists or whatever. Uh, Bonnie Hayes was one and Steeler. <laughs> Steeler. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's absolutely insane because, you know, I'm a, I'm a young kid at the time. I'm like a freshman in high school and, mm -hmm. and I'm going to the stone nonstop and it's, you know, it's head on it's road runner. It's Le Mans, It's vicious rumors, these bands. And, and you guys were older and we were kind of kids. They let all ages into the stone, which I have no idea how, since they sold hamburgers, it was considered like a, a restaurant. And, <laughs> and so I started hanging there and it's really my introduction into, Oh my God. Other than the big famous bands, there's bands that do this that aren't the the big famous bands. Because before that, you know, you're in the 70s, you're listening to music on the radio, you're going to concerts and stuff. But you don't understand that bands start in clubs when you're a kid. And yeah. then when you start to find that out and you're going, you become obsessed like, wow, I, I maybe I could do this. And you start following these bands that become your favorite bands other than Van Halen, ACDC, Ted Nugent and Boston and all of that. It's like this, this local scene and it was fucking massive. So I start watching you guys and it quickly become my favorite. And I start seeing you everywhere and I become friends with the whole band. Yeah, absolutely. And the Mario thing was your manager. <laughs> Mario. Yeah. Mario. <laughs> Mario. Uh, yes, he was our manager, but uh, I'll take a credit for a lot of the stuff that happened. Uh, he he and I worked real close together, so you know, I that was a big part of my job. Like every flyer that was ever made, or poster, or our album cover, the back of our album, the insert, I did all that shit, every bit of it. Yeah. How does it start? I loved it. Yeah, you know, like, were you from Marin, or how does this whole thing start? So get this. Um, I graduate high school here in Tacoma, Washington. That's where I am right now. Yeah. And I literally, cap and gown, I'm in the car, and I'm heading to California because I want to have a career. Because I already had a career up here. I mean, I was in a lot of bands up here, but I knew it was just not going to go anywhere, right? Nobody had made it out of Seattle, Tacoma, uh Hendrix didn't he had to go to London um uh, Hart. Hart, they had to go to Vancouver Canada right Queensryche was about the only one but that was after I had already moved yeah you know 
And yeah. way before the Seattle scene, of course. Oh, way before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're talking 70s. Yeah, exactly. It was the 70s. Yeah. So I was cap and gown. Okay. Right before graduation, I climbed this water tower and I painted 80 rocks, you know, with a couple of buddy of mine. And our colors were, uh, uh, what was it? Blue and orange. So I remember looking at my hands on the steering wheel and I still had blue and orange paint all over my hands from, from painting that on the way to California. And uh, I stopped in to see my grandparents in Mill Valley. And then I headed for LA. I was there about 10 days. I go, oh, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna figure this out. I'm, I'm gonna figure out the scene. I'm gonna get in touch and, and get, get going. Nope, I couldn't even find a place. I, I just spent all my money on these horrible cheap hotel rooms, right? And I'm going, oh God, what am I gonna do? I better get back to my grandparents, kind of regroup and figure it out, you know? And I came back and that's, I never left. I mean, I started meeting people and pretty soon I'm in a band called Vandal. And uh, uh, mostly the people were from Son uh, Sonoma. And uh, yeah, and then our first show uh, as Vandal um, was at the Phoenix Theater. Oh, yes. Opening for Y&T. Yeah. Middle band was Mad Hatter. Oh yeah, remember Mad Hatter? Oh yeah, Harry um, Hayes. Uh, uh, what's that? Harry? I mean, uh, Mary Hazel. <laughs> Mary Hazel. Yeah. Mary Hazel, David Carey, who yep. became our drummer, Eris, who became our bass player. So they pulled me aside that night and said, "We we want to get rid of our singer. We want to talk to you." And that's how it happened. So I was. Hey, so they wanted to get rid of Mary. And and just start a band with you? No, they wanted to keep Mary. Oh. Yeah. Uh, as a guitar player. And oh. um, yeah. And then we uh, worked on a lot of tunes for quite a while. I We never played live. Um, Mary ended up leaving or... Mm. Started Hazel. Yeah, exactly. With Davy Davy Vane Bellano, you know. <laughs> exactly. Right. By the way, looking back, you know, uh, the two the two bands or people or however you want to artists that I always saw is they're just they're gonna make it, right? They're gonna make it. And that was that was Mary. I, I thought oh, she's so freaking talented. I mean. My God, she can sing, she can play, she plays the keys, she writes great. You know, she's got stage presence of the ass, man. She's awesome. And the other one was head on. I'm like, God, these oh. guys, there's no way they're not going to make it. Right? But neither one of them did. And and anybody who says, oh, yeah, I was back back in the day and, I, you know, with Metallic and all that stuff, I knew they were going to make it. Bullshit. No Bullshit. way. No. No way. No way. There were so many bands. <sighs> Come on. You know, now let me let me ask you something. When you hit into L.A., we're talking 1980. Now, 1980 in L.A. is a different L.A. than it was three years later. Yeah. There was punk rock was really large going on, um, and the whiskey was mostly doing punk shows, and there wasn't really. Look, Van Halen had just put out like Women and Children. So right. there wasn't like this Van Halen quote unquote hair rock thing going on. Van no. Halen was, you know, once they hit the stages, they were never back there again. And it was a ghost town around Sunset Strip until around Quiet Riot hits, Motley Crue hits. And then you get the next wave of all of that stuff of Warrant and GNR and Poison and all that. But in 80, 81, 82, we're talking Black Flag, we're talking X, we're talking, uh, you know, all of that stuff going on there. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, later on, when, when we were playing, it seems, I swear to God, those guys were playing across the street from us. But all surfers played across the street from us so many times. And I yeah. always wanted to go get a t-shirt. And I, between sound checks and all that jazz, I never, I, it's one of my big regrets. It's like, I wanted a t-shirt. <laughs> okay. So you play the Phoenix. Yeah. They say we're, we want you as a singer. You join in now you're, you're in mad hatter. Yeah. 
Okay. And you guys gig or you don't gig? No, we, we didn't. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we lost Mary and, um, uh, we had this guy, Mick was playing guitar at the time. And our first show was at the, the Phoenix. So oh God, M vets hall or something, you know, the big thing with, uh, Oh, Eric Martin. Oh yeah. Um, great. And, and we didn't have a name. So yeah. we're like, what the fuck are we going to do? What are we going to call ourselves? Literally as we're walking up on the stage, what do you want to be? What do you, so we said trouser mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Just dumb. Yeah. yeah. Like, okay. Whatever. We can't think of anything. We're trouser mouse. So that first show that we did as Roadrunner, we were trouser mouse. And, uh, and then, then, then we, God, we spent weeks and weeks and weeks trying to, um, figure out a name and i i want to go on record i i never liked roadrunner i never liked the yeah. name I, it wasn't my thing i, I mean vicious rumors cool freaking name yeah roadrunner me me no well roadrunner and le mans were dumb names you yeah, know exactly. which is which is interesting because you're like these are some dumb ass names you know <laughs> yeah. but it really was hard to come up with a band name because you got four fucking guys you're like what are we going to be called okay well we don't have any we're not going to be called Hume, you know, we're not going to be called <laughs> Carrie, whatever, you know what I'm saying? So once you don't have the band members names, then you find a name. Oh, fuck. There's one in the UK. We can't use that name. And then eventually you're just fucked in your Roadrunner. So, yeah. So you come up with Roadrunner and you start gigging. Are you playing like um, Uncle Charlie's and, and that stuff? No, we didn't do Uncle Charlie's, but we did like zerbinos and uh oh gosh somewhere in sonoma or something yeah. like potty cabaret oh yeah um, a lot of small stuff and um i mean in the city it really didn't break until we got metal mondays right and we kind of dominated really quickly there and um i remember the most memorable show there was with metallica and uh they opened for us Wow. And Bill Graham made a fucking killing that night. Oh. He, it was, you know, the Metallica goes on, right? Yep. There was all 14 year old boys with their homemade Metallica jackets and stuff. Totally packed, completely sold out. Metallica gets off stage. All those, those boys leave and all these girls come in and it was. Resell tickets. It was, it was like in two hours. Bill Graham made twice the amount on that venue on the old wall. I was like, damn, why didn't we, why didn't I meet with Lars? Cause Lars and I were always, you know, talking and, and he knew I was a big part of management for our band. So he's always asking me, how'd you get that show with Motley Crue? You know, and all that stuff. He tracked me down and asked me a bunch of questions, but why didn't we get together and say, we should just throw a show together. Let's yeah. just bring up our money. It rent like a Amvets hall or something. And yeah, we're going to kill it, but we never did. It's just dumb. Now, yeah. listen, you're okay. Now you're playing old Waldorf. Yeah. Metal Mondays. What people don't understand was this is one of the most prestigious, radical, great nights of, of metal every week. KRQR, yeah. I believe was promoting it. Metal Mondays. And man, you know, it, now it is known as the Punchline Comedy Club, but it was the goddamn Mecca. ACDC played there. Motley Crue played there. Metallica played there. All when they were unknown or just coming up. And it was a small, amazing room that Y&T basically kind of put on the map. They'd play like every six weeks, had the long tables. They had wireless guitars. They would run down the tables. So you're playing this. At what point do you create the sound of Roadrunner? Like, obviously, it's a heavy vision of visually of Van Halen. Uh, right. By the time I'm really into the band, it's four piece. It's Alan, you, uh, Dana, and, and Aries. Four piece band, very Van Halen, almost identical, but not sounding like Van Halen. A matter of fact, I listened to uh, Working for the Day recently, and it was almost Maiden. If you listen to the riff, it's so. At what point 
does Alan come in and do you and the band create like, okay, this is the flavor we want to go. Yeah, it was really the turning point was Alan. Uh, before that, Sean Lewis was our guitar player. Sean Lewis. You remember him? Yeah. He came on to be in London. Yep. Yeah. And um, among other things, I mean, he was in a lot of bands, but I think London, he did fairly well. Right. Right. So um, for just a brief a period of time, I want to say maybe six shows or something. It was Alan and Sean playing together. So it was five piece. Right. And then uh, Sean decided to leave. We were playing in uh, Bakersfield and, and he had enough and was like, I'm out, man. See ya. And uh, he actually just didn't see him for a very, very long time after he just left from the parking lot. I'm like, okay, what just happened? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Um, How do you find Alan? Uh, you know, through Howard. Team oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Head on. Yeah, head on. So we played with head on all the time. And matter of fact, we played with head on. We were the band right after them in Bakersfield at the Bakersfield Inn. And so we were always playing with those guys one way or another. And Howard just said, you know, you, you should just have my brother audition. And it all oh, that's all it took. He just auditioned the first time he auditioned. He had so many songs. You know, he's like, listen to this. Well, I, I'm working on this riff, but I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet. You know what I mean? And it's like, damn, this guy's just a machine. So, so was he the, the, the main songwriter? Um, not necessarily. Uh, he did working for the day when you're talking about, yeah. Um, I did, uh, teenage war cry. I wrote that when I was 15 in my bedroom in Tacoma here. Wow. <laughs> that thing were had you, a long life. You yeah. were playing guitar. Um, and then later just became a front man. By the time I know you, you did play guitar. Yeah, I wrote uh, right. with a guitar. I tried once playing a guitar on stage and I, I I felt like it was an anchor that just held me. Like I couldn't do anything. Right. So I didn't like it. So I, I got rid of it. But plus I wasn't, I'm not that good at writing. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. Playing live. Eh, no, not really. You know, not my forte. But um but he really brought in the sound and then Eris wrote a lot of songs, but really it was all of us contributing together, you know? Right. Um, and, and we just really uh, clicked, uh, you know, for whatever reason. And by so, the way, yeah, I was just going to say that probably the most unusual and best thing about Roadrunner is we were all close, close friends then. And we're just fucking brothers now. I mean, we're family. We're, we're all our kids, Everybody, you know, everybody knows each other. And, and it, it's really, it's been a a, a a blessing in my life to have those guys around. So he comes in and, 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 and I mean, I really can't, um, you know, I can't tell people enough. I can't, I can't really tell you the magnitude of how big this band got. And I talked about it on, uh, and I kind of choke up by it because it was, it was really one of the most organic, insane things I'd ever seen where this band is just starts killing it. And it's obviously Van Halen, the look and stuff, but the tunes were amazing. And they're playing you on some local radio reptile was unbelievable. <laughs> and you guys start playing all over, you know, like Eric Martin was doing, like Y&T was doing. And it was really like you could tour California and really get your your fucking your craft on. So by the time you guys are starting to really headline all the time, it's so mind boggling to see how good it was. You know, if you talk to people now that maybe are in a band. They always say like, yeah, you know, we were, we were fucking, you were just a kid and it was a thing, but it really had an impact on a lot of people like myself that started playing like, oh my God, if I could sell out the stone, I would, I had made it. And I, I said this, you guys were like the only band I ever knew at the time that sold out the stone two nights. It was <laughs> fucking insane. <laughs> so when you get Alan in, is it like, look, we're going to go for the Van Halen thing? No, absolutely not. We never even ever even talked about that or 
I tried to reach that. I mean, my favorite band in, in the world at that point in my life was uh, the Platters. I wow. mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I wasn't into any of that jazz. And I, you know, I got that baby Lee Roth shit all the time. Yeah. And, and so I think it was Eris told me, why don't you just dye your hair black, dude? So I did. And I look like I should be in typo negative or something, you know, <laughs> freaking weird. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, okay, this, I can't do this. I look like a freak. So there were those points where we said, okay, it's a little too Van Halen-ish. Let's change it up or, or whatever. And we always knew we needed another guitar player. So right. that's when Mark Holly came in. Right. And that's when, when our sound just really, you know, just tweaked in, man. It was that's he added so much to what we were doing yeah so. sacramento guy right yeah but he was yeah. in panther yeah panther yeah i remember when he auditioned in like uh sander fell at allen's uh like loft next to nave lanes there in nevada or whatever you remember that place i, I was fuck yeah dude i remember everything about road road runner <laughs> I, I spent many, many nights at the cave. I, I learned everything about what I was doing in my band from Roadrunner, a band house. I was like, if we could get a band house, we would, I always had this drive and it was from watching Roadrunner and some songwriting of Le Mans and Vicious Rumors, these band and Y&T and yeah. Eric Martin, the Eric Martin band. These bands to me, were fucking just another level because they played all the time. They rehearsed all the time. They lived together. Eric Martin band lived in Petaluma together, you know, on the fucking East side in a house. So it was <laughs> like, okay, you got to get a band house or you live in a warehouse with your band. You know, like at one point I lived in a warehouse and, you know, built a loft like uh, Alan did, you know, it was just <laughs> whatever you could do to play rock and then you work construction during the day. That's what you fucking did. So <laughs> now you guys start to get big and I never knew the story of what happens here. Do labels start to come around? Yeah, actually Dio approached us uh, and he got us um, uh, a show at the country club in LA. Yeah. And it was a showcase for all the labels. Dio? Yeah. How Dio. the fuck did he see you? I have no idea. No clue. It just, all of a sudden it started, they started approaching us and, and he didn't, I mean, his, his uh, management and things right. like that. And his wife, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I don't recall her name. Wendy. Wendy. Yeah. yeah. So she, she really had a lot to do with, uh, she liked the band and all this. And, um, it was so weird. We played with Legs Diamond open for us. Remember them? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So when I was a kid, I loved Legs Diamond. And uh, they opened for us that night. And I remember meeting the lead singer and I said, oh God, I, I was starstruck. You know, it's like, I, I've listened to you since I was a little kid, man. This is awesome. And he looks at me <clears throat> and spits on the floor as I sit there <laughs> with my hand up. Oh, 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 <laughs> I thought, what a dick. Anyway. So, so we, you showcase for labels? Yeah, we showcased that night for labels. Everybody was there. Every single label was there. They put us in a hallway and each one of them came in one door and then out the other. So they came down the hallway. Everything the label said had to do with the way we looked. I knew you know, it. You're too much leather. You got to lose the leather. Your hair is too long. You got to cut your hair. Your hair is too short. You got to grow your hair. Uh, you need more leather. It, nobody, not one label said anything about our music. And I was devastated. I remember calling my parents that that night from a hotel room and just, I want to come home. I, yeah. I, was, I was so like, what the fuck was that? That was terrible. Yeah. And nothing came of it. Um, I mean, the only real serious label offer we got was from Roadrunner Records when nobody knew who they were. Yeah. You know? And and I'm like, they called and I'm like, okay, they're interested in us because of the name association, right? <laughs> how, how lame, right? Yeah. And I'm like, I talked to the guy on the phone. So, so what's up, man? And he goes, um, you know, uh, we want to sign you. I'm like, okay, so what, what got you interested in us? And he said, 
you played with black and blue at the uh, rock on Broadway. Yeah. And oh yeah. That was great. You threw out beers to everybody, at, you know, in the audience. And we thought that was so cool. And I'm like, so you want to sign us? Cause I threw all these beers to, to our fans. Oh, yeah. Huh. And I'm like, uh, yeah. Okay. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh, I was wow. like, you were there that night because I, there. I think I got a picture. You did you cut your head on one of the bottles? And we yeah, were, yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah. I got a picture of you backstage. Uh, you know, Brent and, Turner. Yeah, that's Brent Turner. But the Boneheads, that our road crew. And by the way, we have the best road crew ever. I'm just saying that because they were Boneheads that night. I said I gave them like fifty bucks in cash, sixty bucks, and said, "Get as much beer as you can." And just stack it all on the drum riser and all over the stage. We're going to throw them to the audience. They bought glass yeah. instead of cans. And I'm like, oh, man, everybody's cutting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, fucking that show was fire, man. It's like Roadrunner and, and you know, hold on to 18. But, yeah. you know, Black and Blue had the fucking couple <laughs> of hits. That. Oh, my God. Yeah, dude. I You know, my memory is fucking really good up until around uh cell phones mm. you know and also no computer and none of that and i think it was also because it was just so goddamn organic and i was taking it in like i can't believe all of this music you know that was just coming at us and the stone which is one of the greatest clubs of all time does not get any glory. You know, they talk CBGBs, they talk to whiskey, but the stone, what went down in there, it was insane. Wow. Everybody from Garcia to Slayer to Roadrunner to fucking GNR, uh, yeah. you know, Alice in Chains, Mother Love Bone, you fucking name it. We had them, man. And it was, wow. And the owners and the the way they ran that place was so fucking cool, like a clubhouse. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it was so cool. Yeah. And you know, another thing I really liked about that place was I could go out into the that foyer kind yeah. of thing and talk to, to fans and not like yell and scream. and. Rah, rah, rah. I love that. Yeah. And I could just chat with them and then go back and wait until it was time to go on stage and it was, it was so much more intimate. At what point do you guys realize, fuck, man, we are getting big. Is it that double night? Um, I think that might have been your record release, um, you know, EP release. Was it <laughs> that double night of like, holy shit, we sold it out two nights? I don't know if it was that. Or it seemed to me it was a little before that. But I I have a, a really good memory of... of uh, that night we did our our album release. I do too. Yeah, do you remember? I remember a rap you did. I, oh, I really? tell I tell the story a long a lot a lot. <laughs> I I don't know specifically no word for word, but in the middle of a tune, I think it might have been reptile where you do the rap. You know, yeah. You brought it down, and you were like, you know, you start out there at some backyard parties. And, you know, you're, you're learning to write songs and you're getting it together. And then you play some gigs at high schools or whatever. And then you sell out and headline the stone two nights or something like that. And <laughs> I was in the back going, fuck yes. And it was, <laughs> and as, as corny as that might sound to see that, like these guys were making it, you know, and just a, a couple of years later, Metallica explodes, of course. Oh, but yeah. to see somebody really, I mean, this is early rock, man. This is, uh, you know, like I said, pre hair metal or anything, this is like 81 two, and yeah. the stone is full on fucking rock, man. Oh, hell yeah. Like before Most the business even knows how to even deal with it. This is right before the us festival of 83. So the business is like, what is going on here? I would have to say that too with Metal Mondays and Bill Graham. He yeah. had no idea, no idea. It was yeah. like a oh, boom, right? Yeah. Yep. And then remember they started doing the best of Metal Mondays? Yeah. They'd do it on a Friday or a Saturday and they just get the three best bands and, and they're killing it, right? I mean, oh, yeah. what a cool time too to walk in and see a show, you know? Oh my you know, God. The best. The best. 
it, yeah. it it's really it's really mind boggling how many venues there were too. If you just start from Santa Rosa and you go all the way to San Jose, yeah, the, you know you got the Katati Cabaret, the Phoenix yeah. Theater, and then minus all of the fucking uh, VFW halls and the civic centers. You uh -huh. know, Marin Civic, all that shit where people are playing. You got Uncle Charlie's. You got New George's. You have the Stone. You have the Berkeley Stone, Keystone. You mm -hmm. have, uh, you know, um, the the one, um, what was the one in San Jose? The Cactus Club. You got uh -huh. Nile Station. You have, I mean, so many clubs. It's not even funny, you know? Yeah. And, and, and and these bands, all of them were, the venues were full. Tuesday yeah. night, full. <laughs> I know. Isn't that the truth? That's so, it was, it was magical. I mean, I felt, I mean, I never took advantage of that. I knew I was in a weird bubble. Yeah. Like, this is a cool bubble right now. I just knew it. I mean, I could feel it. Everybody was doing well. Everybody was making decent money, you know? And it was awesome. Lots of opportunity, you know. Yeah. But, now, were you working a job while you were in Roadrunner or, you know, I, or were you making yeah. good money? Uh, you know, it, uh, funny story. I saved a lot of the money from Roadrunner uh, that I made. I was very, very careful about it. And it helped me buy my first house in what? Oklahoma. Yeah. From a club crazy? band. From a club band. Yeah. Fuck. Where was that? In that Tacoma? Was, yeah, in Tacoma. Wow. I bought my first house when I was 26, 27, something like that. Unreal. And I know. And it, it was I was just really frugal with my money. There's times where the guys would go stay in hotel rooms and stuff. And I'd sleep on the freaking stage, man. <laughs> uh, and you know, they'd be like sweeping and everything. And I just asked permission, can I just sleep on the stage? And I, I just crash on the stage and, and then get up in the morning and drive home. And, you know, I just do that stuff like that to save my money. Right. <laughs> <And> it worked. <laughs> now, but, yeah. who lived in the cave? It was Alan and who else? It, me, it was me. Okay. I got to tell you the story of the cave. Yeah. Let's tell them what it is, where it is and why it got the name and everything. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's right there in Mill Valley on Laurel. And, um, it, it when I first looked at the place, I was with my mom and I was what, 1920? I don't know. You know what I mean? I was pretty young. Right. Uh, she had a coastline with me because I was so young. Right. Uh, so we go in there and there's a there's nothing in the whole place. And but there's a Bammy sitting on the the kitchen counter. A Bammy Award? Bammy Award. And I'm like, what the hell? I pick it up. And it's Chris Hayes. Whoa, Harry yeah. Lewis. Yeah, so he had the apartment before I did. That's fucking insane. So he moves out and leaves his Bammy there? Yeah, I, he must have come back and got it because I, it, you know, it wasn't there when I finally moved in. But yeah, it was just sitting on the counter. And my mom's like, what's this? <laughs> I'm like, it's a Bammy. <laughs> Dude, that's like fucking... <laughs> that I mean, that is mind boggling music history because he probably had just started getting some money with Huey exactly. and was like, I'm out of this fucking apartment. This and then dumb. here comes the new band who has no idea it's even a band apartment. But now it has it's housing you guys. Now, yeah. I can't remember. It was an apartment. Right. And it was on the yeah. lower level. It was. And and and. And so, okay, so you get it at 19, and you, Alan, who else lived in there? Eris. Okay, and is and it three-bedroom or two or one or what? It was, it was two, and Eris and I shared a bedroom because the master was big. He took one half, and I took the other half. <laughs> yeah, and then, remember, course, Dave, you remember how much it was? Oh, God, I you know, I want to say it was like 600 bucks or something. Right. Yeah, a month, and split three ways. <laughs> And so was the idea of like, let's get a band house and we'll be together at all times. Not really. It just kind of happened. Um, and it gave us, I think, you know, we'd start writing, you know, and like, oh, you know, fooling around with something. And pretty soon it gets late and yeah. you've had a few and it's like, well, oh, just spend the night. And then pretty soon it's like, nah, I think I'm just going to live here, <laughs> you know, ah. 
Oh, now yeah. the the parties that went down in that fucking place oh, the, yeah. were the neighbors going crazy? They really didn't, which I cannot figure out why they didn't. I could never figure out why. When I finally left the cave, um, I the reason I left, I woke up one night and it was like I was I was going to the bathroom and I got out of the bathroom. It's like, oh, somebody left the front door open. And, and I walk to the door and as I'm walking, I step over and I'm stepping over a midget and then I'm stepping over a biker. All these people are laying on the floor. Then I'm stepping over, you know, just one person after another. And I'm like, to get to the freaking front door, I, there's like 12 people sleeping on my floor. And I'm like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> I'm yeah. Like, yeah. I can't take it anymore. It's like, this is too weird. <laughs> well, I always think about it now because I think back and I think I'm like 17, you know, uh, 16 and I'm, and and I'm fucking partying in these places full on. I mean, full on partying. And yeah. I, I think back about it now and I'm like, well, there, there never seemed to be any neighbors or cops called maybe on a giant, like 20 keg party, but these house parties and apartment parties, oh. they would be like after the stone. All right, meet at the cave. And you'd go there and there'd be 50 people in this apartment. <laughs> cranking no. tunes drinking <laughs> zero fucking cops or or neighbors like shut up it, it's fucking nuts i know all the neighbors were there actually yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah. which is funny because when we did a reunion 10 years later at new georgia's yeah we did a reunion there all our neighbors from that place were there to see us play i'm like god that's what a trip <laughs> well, what's really weird too is how time now, when you look back, you go, wait a minute, this band was only together about five years. Yeah. But when yeah. you're a kid, it seemed like forever. And then one day you were gone. Yeah. And I think you guys played a farewell gig or something. I remember you guys shot the There Goes the Neighborhood video. Yeah. Alan was going to move to LA because his brother lived in the Houdini uh, mansion, the, yeah. which later on was where, you know, G and R rehearsed and shit. And I, I met Axel the first time and all that, that, that became another fucking wave of insanity in the team and family. Uh, yeah. the, ma the mansion later becomes Rick Rubin's place where he records blood sugar, sex magic and, 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 know you know, and when I fucking think about the stories, I think, and I talked about this with, I think with, um, with uh, Jeff Thorpe, you can barely tell people these stories because they think you're full of shit. Because <laughs> they'll look at you and you go, you don't even understand what was going on. It was 24 seven music. That's all it was about. It's just oh, fucking man. Drinking and rocking, you know? Absolutely. Yep. So what happens? You go five years. Yeah. Okay, you, you move out of the cave. Where do you move? You're still in the band, but you move out of the cave. And how much longer are you in the band after that? I moved into the city after that. Um, oh, at Mario's or that apartment building? Yeah, 1111 Pine Street. I, 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 it's weird because later when I moved to San Francisco, I moved on Pine Street a block from that. And I was oh, like, well, because I knew where that was because I went over to the apartment to buy an EP because I don't know if you didn't have them at the show or you sold out of them or something, but I went and he answered the door and sold me an EP. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's So great. you moved to the city. Yeah. And uh, let's see, I moved to the city and... Um, uh, that's, I was living with my future ex-wife. Uh-huh. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so, and she was paying the other half of the rent and it was pretty spendy, even with Mario, you know, managing the building. Right. It was still, I want to say like 1200 bucks, 13, 14 a month. Wow. That's Back in then. The eighties. Yeah. Early eighties. That's, that's crazy. For That was a studio. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, well, they, that was Knob Hill, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I lived in Lower Knob and where, you know, Pine and Larkin, where, you know, 
uh, like hookers would break your car window and use your car as a, a fucking, a, a fucking, just a, a hotel room for the night. And you'd come down <laughs> and your car would be littered in old dirty condoms and shit. It was crazy. If you just went three blocks down from uh, Mario's place, it was like, whoa, the tenderloin, <laughs> you know? Ouch. Yeah. 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 So you're living there and, and how much longer are you in the band? You know, my son was born in 84. Yeah. And, uh, I'm a senior in high school then. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. He was born February of 84. And then I was out in 85. So uh, I guess I, you know, I guess I moved in and to the city about the uh, end of 83, you know, well, wait, no, it had to, be sooner than that yeah probably the mid 83 something yeah. like that but um i basically you know got the ultimatum and you know if you ever want to see your son again you'll quit the band and of course i did you know wow, wow. And, and it was weird because you know where we were at we were right right there we were yeah. right there so it was really kind of tough um but i do not regret it at all and you, you were talking about that bowling alley yeah that's where i gave him the bad news Oh, wow. In the bar at the bowling alley there. Yeah, yeah. 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 And um, I just said, when you guys get older and you have kids, you're going to understand what's what's happening here. You know, oh, not they lanes, right? You just yeah. went over there and you and you had you laid it on them. I'm leaving. Yeah. And this is why. And, you know, I, I want a life with my son. And, you know, and this isn't really the lifestyle I think is going to work for it. And and uh they, you know, they were all mad, but they've all said you made the right decision and they all love their kids. And now they understand. Right. They understand that where I was coming from. Now, here's the the thing I heard, which was interesting. They're like, oh, he moved to Seattle. His dad owns a hotel and he's going to manage the hotel. Was that right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Isn't that fucking nuts? That is totally nuts. No, my my dad's a, a famous guy. He's uh, he's been on television for fifty six years. What? So yeah, he. So I grew up in a very, you know, anybody from the Northwest knows my who my dad is, and so like I wrote down these guys. Let's see if you remember these guys. Uh, uh, Jeff Pilson from Dawkins. Of course, had yeah, him on the show. He knew me because of my dad. He's like, you're Ed Hume's son. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Freaked out. Is Rod he a news guy? No, no. Uh, gardener. He's He was on gardening with Ed Hume. I don't TV. know that. It's yeah. a TV show? Well, it used to be. He's 93 now. So Yeah, but up in Seattle, up in the Northwest or something? It was Seattle, Portland, I, uh, Boise. Uh, eventually, right. we were on in San Francisco. Uh, wow. NBC. San Francisco, yeah. Wow. So I directed his show for 25 years. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I know. So I had a legitimate job and short hair, and you know, but you know, when I was in Roadrunner, I was going to college, and I, I was studying film uh, from high school. I, I always was infatuated with film. I always wanted to be a film director. It was yeah. my passion, and so. I had that structure and that background so that when I left Roadrunner, I went directly to NBC in Seattle and started working, you know? Wow. So, yeah. Now, EP. Yeah. You, you get you don't get a deal. And at some point, there's always these Coke dealers or these guys that come cruising around with money and they're like, oh, I'll put out your record. How does the EP happen? Where was it recorded? And why did you choose Venus instead of There Goes the Neighborhood or any other song? You had a ton of songs and you chose a cover on a four song EP. Yeah. And I don't know why we ch chose the cover, but you know what? Uh, we hadn't written There Goes the Neighborhood yet. Oh, that gotcha. Was, that, came, that came later. Yeah. Right. But we did, you're right. We had other songs. But we recorded it at Hun Sound. A uh, uh, Hun Sound, the rehearsal yeah. place. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's. Yeah. Did you rehearse there? Yeah, we rehearsed next to Sammy Hager. I rehearsed. Well, I shared with Metallica. I shared my studio. <laughs> Remember the cross the street ones? Yeah, Huey Lewis in the News was across the street, and we were there. 
fucking great. And remember Thomas? Hey guys, that drunk guy that kind of was like the guy that would <laughs> open your room, Thomas. You yeah. better pay your rent, man. Yeah, yeah, Thomas. Here's a here's a beer. Let us in, dude. We'll pay later. Oh, fuck. <laughs> sound, dude. We lived there, man. And we had that place for years. Wow. It, yeah. It was so, the greatest. Oh, I loved it. Yeah, it was it, it was perfect. And um, a lot of good memories there. But we actually, Dr. Richie Moore recorded us there. Um in, was in it the, like an eight-track portable or what was it? No, it was. I, he maybe he brought it with him. I don't know. Right. But it, he had just got back to the Bay Area or moved to the Bay Area, and um, he actually recorded us on videotape. Uh, I mean, our audio. And he says, "This is an experiment I've been trying to figure out. I'm looking for the certain tone, and I'm going to record on videotape." Well, like early A Dad. Yeah, it was really weird, but it it got this weird kind of warm sound you know yeah. everybody said oh man that's the san francisco sound you know you can totally tell you guys are from san francisco just and i'm thinking well he, he really was messing around a lot so I, I don't know how that happened but but yeah so we recorded it there and then how um, many days one two week i think it was about a week yeah, yeah. and um we had just written um reptile Oh feel like God! Was, Great yeah. song. So Alan came up with that, you that know, Egyptian thing. Yeah, and and na, 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 na. We're all going, make it more Egyptian, make it more Egyptian, you know. And then he starts putting in claps. I don't know, yeah. it's really subtle, but there's like these claps that he put in and bells, like ching, 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 you know? yeah. <laughs> but that that's how new that song was. There was no no lead, so he was just writing it on the fly. Wow. Oh, and then, you know, talk about studio stuff too. We ended up in at AM Records in LA. And I think Dio had something to do with this too, but I'm not sure if it was one of Alan's connections. But I think Dio said, get in there, do some songs. Uh, I want to hear some new material or something like that. And we wrote by far the two best songs we ever wrote. And we wrote them in the studio on this piano that the Carpenters wrote their music on. Wow we're just banging it out and God, we had one song uh called uh don't count me out that i by far by far our best song it was tight everything was perfect and nobody heard it <laughs> and did you and you guys record it and you don't have it anywhere oh no we have it yeah i've oh, got wow. it and what yeah. was the other song when the night is over wow. we were trying to come up with a, a fun uh like encore song yeah yeah. And it you, turned out really good too. You know, what's interesting to me is, you know, once the hair metal thing happens, the labels are like, go out and sign every guy with long hair and, you know, and spandex <laughs> or whatever. But it's really wild because the draw that you guys had, the amount of people, people don't understand an unsigned band drawing 800, a thousand people a yeah. night, a thousand people. I'm trying to put that in perspective to people <laughs> is so fucking monumental. And it's weird because if Van Halen, you know, they were starting to get bigger and bigger. You would think that somebody at a label would go, go find me some new Van Halen's right yeah. now, you right. know? Which is really, that's how dumb they were at the time because later really? they didn't give a fuck what you did. They just signed you, you know? They got long hair. They sold out the whiskey. Sign them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but you guys, you know, and, and at the time I started thinking San Francisco had a little bit of a stigma where if you weren't an L.A. band, you were, you know what I'm saying? It was like, yeah. it took a long time for Le Mans to get a deal. Finally on CBS, it took a long time for Eric Martin. It took a, it never happened for Roadrunner. Uh, yeah. Huey Lewis, just a fucking club band forever. And, yeah. and, and journey was huge. And, and, and still there was this stigma of like, there wasn't not until Metallica. And then they were like, all right, give us all the metal bands, Testament, Exodus, you know, Mordred. <laughs> Uh, possessed everything but it, there was this thing where labels would come up and it happened with my band they would just watch you 
and they go, great, take out the food. And you just, that was it. It was yeah. weird. It was weird. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and these bands were incredible. Yeah. And I think about some of the shows. I mean, for instance, we played uh, East Bay, um, do not know the name, never, never played there before. I mean, you know, it, it was just like one of these hole in the wall. It was actually like hanging over the Nimitz. I remember Dave, you know, or Dave, Deadly Dave, our drummer, going, James, come here, come here, come here. And he opens the curtain behind his drum riser and the Nimitz is fucking right there, like the card. <laughs> right? So guess who we played with? Who? Except opened. Wow. Remember Culprit, the band Culprit? Of course, that was yeah. Mike Varney. Yeah, they, yeah. they were a middle band, and then we headlined. Wow, <laughs> it was, it was like, I would say probably maybe six hundred seater, and there might have maybe possibly been two hundred people in there. Yeah, I'm like where the hell is everybody? Yeah, right. It, like, yeah, this is an incredible show. Let's you know? go through some of the people that you opened for, big ones. Y&T so many times, I can't even count. Right. Yeah, I mean, literally, I, it's too many times. Um, and somebody on their staff liked this. I don't know who, I don't know why we got picked. Uh, um, Motley Crue. Where at? Twice. You know, I don't remember. Isn't that I think weird? I think it was uh, Old Waldorf, one of them. But, yeah, well, we did a, like a QR thing at Old Waldorf with them. Like right. they came on stage and and did some shenanigans for the, like they're picking out girls from the audience or something. Right. Right. But um, yeah. Um, so I don't remember. I've got pictures. Oh, I yeah. know the first place. Oh yeah, I do. The first place we played with them was uh, um, Keystone Berkeley. Oh yeah. And they put their album cover their you know, uh, their first album cover as their backdrop. And it was just like this cardboard thing swinging. And Vince Neil like put this lighter fluid on him, his legs and lit himself on fire. Oh yeah, yeah. No, no, <laughs> Nikki Six did that. Yeah, Nikki oh, Six. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was like, what the hell? I, I feel like Beavis and Butthead right now. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nikki Six. Wow. <laughs> 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 Some down because I couldn't remember. We played with Alden Nova, Spinal Tap. Spinal we Tap. We opened for Spinal Tap. Where was that at? Warfield, right? Uh, no, that was at uh, Wolfgang's. Oh, Wolfgang's. I got a great story about this, too. Yeah. My my grandfather and grandmother came to all my shows, right? Uh -huh. and my gran grandfather was um, just a just really true mu musician, and, and he was a womanizer. So he always wanted to go backstage and, and drink some beer and talk to some women. And um, he, all the people backstage knew him. You know, they all, the security, everybody knew him. So he strolls backstage when we're opening for Spinal Tap, and and my grandmother's going, "Where's, where's your grandfather? God damn it, Paul, where is he?" Ah. And she's just angry as hell. And I'm like, "Okay, I have a feeling I know where he is. I'll, I'll go find him." And um, uh, who was it? Brad Gillis was there. He goes, "I'll sit with your grandma," and uh, he sat down with her and kept her calm while I went backstage to find my grandfather. <laughs> I find my grandfather and he's back there drinking with all of them. Right. And he goes, James, they all wear wigs. Why don't you wear a wig? <laughs> <laughs> and the girl, they're, they're actors. He's oh. like, well, you should just wear a wig. You don't have to have long hair. Just wear a oh. wig. Oh my God. Yeah. That is fucking amazing, man. <laughs> oh, it's hilarious. It's like, uh, it doesn't work that way, grandpa. Man. So, <laughs> Once you leave, you move back up to Tacoma area and stuff. And the yeah. band, they they try to go a little bit, right? They're looking for a singer. Yeah. I remember they were looking for singers. Did you and audition? I, I didn't, but I watched some guys audition, you oh. know. And um, it and then it just went away, and then and Alan moved, you know. And Eric and and Howard had already lived down in L.A., so he moved. And uh, it was, it was a really weird thing. It was like a fucking a bolt of lightning, bam, Roadrunner, Le Mans, then gone. And then the new bands came in. It was like my band, Vane, 
Yeah. Uh, you know, all these new bands came in and the old bands were fucking gone. They weren't like out touring or anything. <laughs> they were gone. It right. was weird. It was like, all right, the new wave is here. And it was crazy. Yeah. Oh, man. I know. Yeah, I remember going back uh, for some reason. I can't remember. And the clubs were all closing. Yeah. And then Bam Magazine disappeared. Yeah. You know? And it was just like, whoa, everything's changing so rapidly. And that's sort of like when the grunge thing started. Right, yeah. And also that 89 earthquake, it ruined that off-ramp to come wow. from the from the East Bay. So you couldn't get to the stone real easy or Broadway where all the clubs were. So it just disintegrated real quick, you know? That's right. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. And you know, the band that came next after you guys, you know, I auditioned and sang for just a, a few months was Jet Boy. So oh, yeah. Jet Boy came next and they were the next big fucking thing in San Fran. And then they moved to LA. They were balls out. They're like, we're out of here. We're moving yeah. to LA and they got a record deal on Electra and they were fucking doing it, you know? Yeah. Was that uh, Frankie or? It, it was Fernie. Fernie. That's yep. It. And, yeah. and, and then also, you know, you had Sea Hags, which was part, you know, it was Willsey from head on yeah. and they got big and kind of, and then there was kind of a hate Ashbury kind of scene going on. Yeah. And 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 then the music scene really caught fire after that because you had Metallica and Exodus and all that. But then you had, uh, you know, Jet Boy and you had, uh, like I said, um, Sea Hags and 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 these bands from Hate Street were happening. And then Four Non Blonde start happens and and, <laughs> and different types of music, you know, and then, of course, grunge. And grunge was, you know, didn't kill the scene around us because Vane or my band would play and then Alice in Chains would play. It, it mostly killed the sales, and, um, but it didn't kill really the scene in San Fran. And not until really John Nady decides to close the clubs. And the scene was starting to trickle then as far as people going out to live music, you know, yeah, in, yeah. in a club, in a club situation. Yeah, yeah. Now I have to ask you, did you, we, we dubbed this thing called, we called it day on the dirt. Do you know what I'm yeah. talking about? Well, you played day on the dirt. Yeah. And it is like one of the most iconic days in thrash metal. And that's it's, I thought so. It was first time oh. I ever saw stage diving in my life. And they're like jumping off the stage in front of me. I'm like, what in the hell are they doing? Slayer played day on the dirt. Yeah, you know, you and, know? And we played with Beastie Boys. Yeah, oh, at the Stone. No, at uh, oh. Day on the Dirt. Oh, Day on the Dirt. Beastie Boys yeah. played Day on the Dirt. I've got the, <laughs> I've got a book over here which I highly recommend people to get, and um, it has all the Day on the Dirt photos in it, which is amazing. And I, I don't see it right here now, but I I can't re recommend it enough. Oh, there it is. It's uh, Murder in the Front Row. Have oh you, yeah. Have you seen the documentary? Yeah, uh we're mentioned in it. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you're mentioned in it. So I'm like, fuck. Uh so that's amazing too because Roadrunner would play with Metallica or play with YNT or play Day in the Dirt, you know? It was just like it was there was no labels really. It was just like rock and heavier rock and these guys are something, you know. <laughs> I have to tell you too uh Funny story, when we played with Metallica, we were so arrogant, we didn't think they were worthy to change backstage with us. Yeah. We made them change in the bathroom. We didn't let them change with us backstage. <laughs> now that's a good thing. Are you, were you, did you guys, cause I didn't really see it. Cause I think I was just kind of like in, like this guy's crazy, just let him in, you know? But were you guys, did you have some egos like, hey, opening band, no sound checks and that kind of stuff? Were you throwing that around? No, not nothing like that. But uh, there was a lot of rivalry, you know, yeah. and yeah. I think we we kind of got tired of the Van Halen shit, you know, so right. we were, we were a little touchy about that, you know. Right. So because um, we were trying our best not to go down that road, but 
it just sort of happened that way. I kind of looked like David Lee Roth and he kind of, you know, Al kind of looked like Eddie, you know? And, oh, it was, it oh, was, yeah. it was exact. You know, <laughs> it's like Alan had the curly hair and you sent me a photo of you on my phone yesterday. And I was like, God damn, that's David Lee Roth right there. I you know, know. that, uh, that's, that was full on uh, me though. You know what right. I mean? It's when I altered and like dyed my hair black and stuff. That's when it was like, yeah. What the hell? <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> I I always thought the interesting move later was once Alan moved, he he was a great player and a great songwriter. And he in my in my personal thing, there's nothing I I hate more. I'm a comedian now, and I was a musician, but I don't like the to combine them. I never have. I've been that kind of snob. And when he moved and started doing Sandman and the Apes. I was just so bummed. I was like, ah, because there was this guy who was the fucking Mecca of San Fran rock. And he's doing like, you know, you know, Beaver Dracula, I'm a Beaver Dracula. And I'm like, ah, you know, it was, it, it was weird. Yeah. You know, I always introduced him on stage as the only living cartoon I've ever met in my life. Love him and leave him, Alan Peeman. <laughs> right? He is a cartoon. Well, yeah, and I, I realize now that, you know, it was probably straining him to be in Roadrunner because he likes to be a wacky, goofy dude, you yeah. know? And uh, so now, uh, you know, I, I real realized it as I've known you guys for fucking 40 years or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, you know Nailed. I can't I can't thank you enough for reaching out, man, because like Jeff Thorpe, I gave Jeff Thorpe a lot of credit for being like kind of my college. Um, but it was really Roadrunner and Y and T for me that really taught me what the fuck, how to play rock and how to be completely, you know, like like showmanship to put yeah. on a show, but at the same time have some good music. And, and I'll tell you, man, being in, you know, a, uh, a freshman in high school and watching Roadrunner and just being blown away and never being able to forget it, you know? So uh, I want to thank you for that, man. Well, thank you. That's that's what a compliment. And you, you, I have to tell you something too: is that anybody that's listening to this, a lot of people know me here in Tacoma. A lot of people know me in Palm Springs. They know nothing about my music career. Yeah. They, when they hear this, they're going to go, "What? Yeah. You know what? You did this. You did." They don't know any. I never talk about it. It's weird for me to talk about it now. I mean, I have a very good memory about everything, but I really. I don't talk about it enough. So it's, right. it's, it's nice. And I appreciate the opportunity. It's very cool. What, uh, what are the connections out of Palm Springs? Oh, I lived there for 10 years. Oh, wow. Uh, loved it. Yeah. Wow, I love bought it a, there. Bought a mid-century house. Oh, Bands that's my life. There. Uh, recorded like videos and photo shoots. And yeah, it was, we really went over the top with it. And uh, I I miss the people there so much. A lot of old musicians and actors and just characters. Everybody's just uber talented, yeah. you know. Yeah. So Palm Springs is God to me, man. Oh, other than other than the hundred goddamn twenty degrees, <laughs> but the vibe of that when you get gaze and art and 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 design and architecture and food and cuisine all wrangled up into one. Mm -hmm. It is unreal what you can have, man. It's just uh, the vibe there is, is excellent. I did a lot of art shows down there. I, you don't know this about me, but I'm an artist for decades. I used to draw in, with uh, uh, Howard Tiemann. We yeah. draw together all the time, but like this painting right here. Oh yeah. It's Boxing Jesus and uh, Kid Rock wanted that thing for half a minute for an album cover. Wow. Wow. <laughs> he was taking me down and, and then his management got a hold of me and they said, well, can you make it more Kid Rock? And I'm like, 
what does that mean? Like yeah. have them hold a beer or something or what? Yeah, 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 yeah. They, or or maybe a, a Trump hat or something. Maybe yeah. they wanted that on that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, they just then they did no more phone calls. But yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I wish that we hooked up um sooner because I was just in Seattle and doing shows, but when I come up there. I've been trying to do the Tacoma Comedy Club for like five years, and it just hasn't happened, which is weird. I know yeah. there's two. Yeah, yeah. But um, I've done a lot of shows there, and uh, I'd love to see you. And uh, yeah, too I bad can't... we didn't. Too bad we didn't hook up earlier because you would have loved our Palm Springs place. It's yeah. Oh, it had oh, a lot of fun there. I can't even tell you how much of a mid-century freak I am. You know. <laughs> I got one more question for you. Uh, Aries, remember he was a, after he left Roadrunner, he became like a Falconer guy, right? Like Falcons? Oh, Eris, yeah. Yeah, Eris, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, he um, did that during Roadrunner. He was doing that during Roadrunner. Oh, yeah, because I think it's on the video on There Goes the Neighborhood. Has he got the Falcon on there or something? No, but that would have been a good idea. Yeah. Actually. No, yeah. but he, we had a song called, uh, oh, God, what was it? Uh, bird of prey it was yeah. a instrumental and that was all inspired by his falcon tree and all that stuff and he he asked me to go out there with him at least a couple times but i i couldn't do it i'm i'm just such a pushy pussy when it comes to like animals and they have to like you have to tear off a you know like a a live bunny's leg and throw it oh, um, fuck uh, no and then and then now where is he and where is uh, Dan, your drummer? So uh, Eris is in Grants Pass, Oregon. Wow. Still in a band. And wow. De Deadly Dave carries in Sausalito. And did you know he's married to Mary? Yeah, yes. I knew that. Now she's Mary Carey. Are they and still married? Absolutely. They're, they're, they're the envy. I, they have, they're just, the, they don't look any fucking different wow. than they did. You know, 40 years ago, they, they're so, such a great couple. And what do they do? Uh, let's see. Dave is a lawyer. Oh, fuck. Mary, Mary is so uber talented. I, I don't even know if I can name all the things she does, but she does videos and she does recordings and commercials and, 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 the, and she plays in a lot of bands too. Still wow. play. Yeah. Wow. Dave does when he can, but yeah. And then uh, let's see, Mark Holly. He is in uh, the in Sonoma, the the town. Yeah, yeah. And he he's he's a great guy. He's playing all the time too. He wow. was with uh, Eric Martin for a long time, and somebody else. Oh, Montrose. He was playing. With oh, Montrose. Wild. Wow. How great is Eric Martin? Holy shit! That that sucker for a pretty face record is a masterpiece. Yeah, it's so weird playing with him back then. He looked like he was 16. I know it was crazy, right? I, he was so young. Yeah. I could never put my finger on it. Like, and it's like people say, no, he's married. And he's like 10 years older than you, James. And I'm like, what? Yeah. No. He had that Dick Clark disease. <laughs> <laughs> I never aged. I love it. <laughs> well, hey, man, stay in touch. Yes. Thank you so much. And uh, what a what a great trip down memory lane, buddy. Um, okay. really, really wild. And you guys, it's really hard to find Roadrunner. Is it on the streaming? I couldn't find it, but I found it, of course, on, um, on YouTube. Yeah. Do you put any links uh, down below or? Yep. Okay. I'll send you some links for some stuff. That'd be great. Yeah. Oh, you didn't tell me why you picked Venus. You know, I didn't. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, I'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't my choice, but uh, yeah, yeah, we did have, we had a song called bad boy. That was probably should have been on there. How many songs did you have? God, all said and done. It's I, yay. I'm thinking 30, 40. Yeah. Know? Yeah. A lot of them didn't last long though. It's like we try them once and if it didn't feel right, they were gone. You know, that's how it was when you're writing yeah. music, you're just churning through them. And then yeah. you go, and then every fifth one you do like, this is a fucking tune, you know? So you probably do that with jokes, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Of oh, course. Man, totally bombs. So I'm not, it's out of here. 
Yeah. Well, you work on the joke for a little while and then after a while, something else comes better and you're like, this is out. Yeah. You watch comedy? I do. I love it. And, uh, oh gosh, what's the guy there? You probably know him in San Francisco. I see him all the time when I'm in town. He's a friend of Alan's too. Um, God, what the hell is his name? He's a comedian. Um, ah, I'm blanking. I'm sorry. That's Same okay. Me, but uh, you'd know this dude. He was a head on. He was a, always around head on. Right. Yeah. Anyway. They had a tune, boy. I'm throwing the book at you. That was <laughs> yeah. so good. I love it. What was that <laughs> singer's name? Mark Berglund. Yeah. Where'd he go? Yeah. He is still writing. That guy wrote most of the material. Yeah. And yeah, that guy can write. He just so talented, just sickly talented. Yeah. He was killer, man. They were the San Francisco cheap trick, man. I know. He had a run in with cancer, uh, and that kind of set him back for a while. And um, and then uh James also in 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 that band had a run in with cancer and yeah problems. Yeah. But did you go to their reunion? Were I didn't. There? I I didn't. I wish I did, man. Oh, dude, you would have loved it. It was I was just I had goosebumps. They they were better now or at then than they yeah. were back then. I, I was just shocked, you know? It's like, God. If, if you listen to your EP now, you think, could you sing any of that stuff or is it uh, too high or too, uh, like whatever, you know? Yeah, I don't know if I could sing anymore. I, I did, what, 45 years of smoking? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think my pipes, I blew my pipes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But well, thanks for doing the show, dude. I can't thank you enough. Yeah. What a fucking what a what a run down memory lane, buddy. Oh you know? yeah. And when you visit, look what I got for you. Wow. <laughs> I still I, got one. <laughs> oh, I fucking love that. Oh my god. It's a little small. <laughs> what size is it? I think it, it's probably a large, but it's a 1980s large. So you know what I mean? Which yeah, I wear I wear medium, medium, man. Oh, then it's yours. Oh my god, that shirt is fucking great. You got so photos fun. and stuff, man, from all those dead years. Are you kidding? I got boxes, man. I got so many photos of you. Oh, you do? Uh, yeah, I got uh, black and blue. I know for sure. Yeah. So I got you at the the uh, uh, our record release thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, I came back to there. Dude, I got to see those. I probably have some of you at the cave too, I'm sure. Of course. Because you know, there's some pretty wacky, you know, we're all, we're all like falling all over each other. Yeah, just, I did. Send, send some of those photos my way. Just, you know, take oh. a picture of them on your phone. I don't give a fuck. I just, I love to look at that stuff. Like I have all my photos too. People trip out. They go, you still got those? It's all I have. I yeah. carry them everywhere. I'm always like, one day they're going to do a documentary on me and they'll need these photos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. All right, man. Well, text uh, text me and please stay in touch. And thank you so much. Um, Love you, man. Yes. And thank you for the memories, buddy. Uh, I mean, you really, you really got me on the path of uh, rock and roll. You, Y&T, Vicious Rumors. Eric Martin, that, that was my, uh, that was my, my college of rock. You know? <laughs> and when you, when you perform here at the Tacoma comedy club, I will be sure and pack the place. Oh. Everybody has to be here, so I'll get them there. Okay, <laughs> man. Okay. I, I can't <laughs> wait to see you. <ya. laughs> Cheers, brother.